Paige Beckers makes history again, the Kelsey's pod has an insane price tag, and the WNBA's new deal could reach $3 billion. It's Thursday, August 1st. I'm your host for the week, John Shames, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The Canadian women's soccer team has lost its appeal to restore the six points deducted from group play after team officials were caught using a drone to spy on opponent practices. Wednesday morning, the Court of Arbitration for Sport dismissed the team's case for appeal. Sport Canada also announced it would be withholding salaries for the suspended coach Bev Priestman and two other team officials. The men's triathlon was finally able to compete Wednesday after the Seine River was deemed clean enough for swimming. French President Emmanuel Macron celebrated the success of the cleanup on Twitter, saying, quote, we've achieved in just four years what was impossible for 100 years. The Seine is now swimmable. The event had been postponed Tuesday after heavy rains increased river pollution. Paige Beckers will become the first college basketball player, men's or women's, to have a signature Nike shoe. Beckers will get her own version of Nike's GT Hustle 3, which was released in early July. The Yukon Star's custom version of the shoe is expected to release on September 12th for $120 retail price. Tuesday afternoon, the Pinellas County Commission approved a $300 million public investment in the Tampa Bay Rays new stadium, which will account for just under 25% of the $1.3 billion total cost for the ballpark. The entire project, which also includes a gas plant, could reach $6.5 billion total. Despite the public funding, the Rays will be on the hook for $700 million of the total bill. The team is now set to stay in St. Petersburg for the long term. EA Sports College Football 25 has already far exceeded the company's expectations. Shortly after the game's release, EA announced that 2.2 million users paid $100 each for early access to the game. According to On3, the game has now sold over $500 million worth of copies since its release two weeks ago. During its first week of regular availability, College Football 25 drew 5 million unique players. Kylian Mbappe is the new majority owner of Khan, a French League 2 professional football club. On Tuesday, it was announced that the Real Madrid forward would use 15 million euro from his coalition capital investment fund to become an 80% stakeholder in the second division French club. He's not the only professional soccer player to own a team, but at just 25 years old, Mbappe becomes the youngest ever. Coming up next, non-traditional sports are on full display at the Olympics, but what's next for those athletes when the games conclude? Owen caught up with Matchroom Sports chairman Eddie Hearn to discuss the proliferation of new sports and their rising popularity worldwide. I'm joined now by the chairman of Matchroom Sport, Eddie Hearn. Welcome, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. So you've been a boxing promoter and executive for a long time. Have you seen the market for the sport and the audience for it evolve in recent years? Yeah, I think boxing's in a great place. I mean, you know, it remains one of the, the hottest, I think one of the sexiest sports, if you, if you like. You know, sometimes doesn't always deliver the, the numbers that the fighters demand. But it remains a sport that's, you know, hotly sought after by broadcasters, by platforms, by fans. And I think when we get it right, I think it's one of the greatest sports in the world. I really do. But right now, I think it's bigger than ever, obviously, with the injection of interest as well from Saudi Arabia and, you know, and other markets around the world. I think boxing's in a great position. Yeah. And I'm wondering the its growth. How much is that tied to just, a, you know, the sort of general increase in interest in fighting sports? And how much would you attribute to, you know, changes in distribution, like um, moving toward, toward streaming platforms and other options like that? Yeah, I think for us, you know, we established a few years ago that streaming was the future of, of live sports. You know, I think traditional sports broadcasters will always carry, you know, a powerful um, viewership. But particularly now, the way that the younger generation are digesting sports content, we felt that it was streaming led and it was app led. And when we made our move to DAZN, especially in America, we were quite criticized, you know, five years ago, what's DAZN? It's an app. No one's going to watch it on an app. And now really DAZN sits as the global home of boxing. So 
I think the way that people are, are digesting and, and you know, as I said, ingesting the content now, you know, the, the, the ability to stream live sports is something that's definitely led to the growth of boxing in the last few years. You've seen that not just on DAZN, but of course ESPN Plus that have done extremely well. Amazon now coming into the, the boxing market. They've done that in Japan. They're now doing that in the United States as well. So, yeah, I think um, more promoters working together, more markets globally coming into the sport, bigger fights getting made, all generating more interest in the sport. And is pay-per-view still part of this picture? I and mean, that used to be the way people watched boxing. Um, yeah. How much is that part of this landscape at this point? I think I think the problem is is that to generate the dollars, you know, I do feel like fighters' purses are sometimes, you know, one of the problems in boxing. You know, there, there's a very a widely discussed topic, which is, you know, in boxing, probably the promoters, <coughs> excuse me, in boxing, the promoters will take around 80% of the revenue of a show, and that will go to fighter purses, with 20% going to the promoter. Maybe the UFC model is a little bit more like 20% of those of that revenue goes into fighter purses and 80% into the promotion. So I think that sometimes fighters' purses and, and the, the market rates are exaggerated because of the demand and because of the aggressiveness of the industry. But pay-per-view is really the only model that you can generate the extreme purses and you know by that i'm talking about the tens the 20s the 40s the 60s the, the hundred million dollar purses that these fighters and their teams are, are seeking after and i think the interesting discussion point about pay-per-view in america is the price point it's very expensive in america you know your price point is really between 70 and 100 dollars for a night of boxing in the uk it's more like 30 35 dollars and you have seen a little bit of a variation. And I think that's important moving forward because we can't just price out viewers all the time on pay-per-view. But certainly when, when the fight is big enough, people will pay. And, you know, when the fight is big enough and there's a pay-per-view fight, and it, that's when you're generating the record paydays for the fighters. So it sounds like you feel something in there needs to change. Either it's, you know, what what the viewers are paying or what the fighters are getting paid or maybe the distribution of it. Is there some, you think, an obvious way to, to start there? Yeah, I think that, you know, ultimately, if the rights fees aren't there to pay the fighters what they would like in terms of those purses, then the only way to do it is via pay-per-view. <clears throat> and, and, and that model will remain, especially when a lot of them are doing very well. I mean, you know, you look at the likes of Canelo Alvarez, He's doing anywhere between 500 and a million pay-per-view buys every time he fights. You know, the, the Ryan Garcia, Javonta Davis fight did a million buys. You know, even Haney against Garcia, knocking in whatever it was, 350, 400. So, you know, there, there is definitely the appetite for pay-per-view nights. I think just sometimes there can be a real oversaturation of pay-per-view. But I guess at the end of the day, does it matter? I mean, the offering is there to the viewer. It's up to them whether they buy it or not. And that will obviously relate to the success and the numbers around the pay-per-view. And, you know, it's obviously boxing's an individual sport. And the the Jake Paul fights, I'm never quite sure to, to make of them. I don't know how seriously they're taken in like the, the boxing community, but they make news every time they happen. Mm. And it just makes me think about how um, it seems like a sport that's could be a, a good fit for the creator economy, the social media world, where everyone's got their own personal brand. Um, because boxing has, has to some degree, relied on personal brands for decades. I'm just wondering what your thoughts there are. Yeah, I think Jake's doing a good job. You know, I think if you can get it in your head as a fight fan that it's not real boxing in terms of, like, elite boxing, do you know what I mean? But, you know, it's, it's not a horrific standard, but it's just not of the standard of, of a world championship fight. But, you know, you look at the gate that he did in Tampa on Saturday, there's a lot of people in the building. Obviously, the fight was on the zone. It would have done good numbers as well. So one thing Jake is, he's very smart. You know, he's, he's a very good uh, self-promoter. He's a great content creator as well. And a lot of those guys from that space have really earned the ability to do whatever they want. You know, whether it's boxing, whether it's table tennis, whatever it is, there's going to be a lot of people tuning in to watch them. I think boxing is probably a little bit more fascinating for people. I think he's making... He's, he's the matchups that he's choosing are very clever, 
And, you know, I think there's a lot of eyeballs on the sport, as long as we don't take it too seriously within the, the kind of real fight community. But, you know, he's training hard. He is improving. There's no shame in not being good enough to win a world championship. There's a lot of fighters that are worse than him. But, you know, it is, it is what it is. And it's, it's I kind of, I, I do put it in the YouTube boxing bracket, which, you know, is always causes great debate within the industry. And MMA is, um, you know, it's risen very quickly in, in the last few years. And I'm wondering sort of how you see its place in, in the fighting world. And is it a, um, not a threat, but is it competition to, to boxing? You know, the UFC have done an incredible job. I mean, I think the whole brand, you know, I say to a lot of our team to watch what they're doing, you know, in terms of their promotion, in terms of the, the way that they're building their brand, especially their international development as well, which is something we're really across. Um, two very different sports. I think they've got, you know, the, the brand that the UFC built and the brand that Dana has built really within himself means that they're an incredibly powerful organisation doing very well in, in markets or shows that they've got to do. And, you know, it's difficult to keep making big fights. But we're very jealous of, of their model, whereby they basically just tell people who they're fighting. You know, every fight that we make in boxing, we have to individually negotiate with the fighter and their team, the manager, the lawyer, the advisor. Sometimes it's no, don't like him, don't like that fight, want to fight somewhere else. In UFC, it's you're fighting him on that day, I'll see you there. And I think that's a great model. Matchroom also... Uh, you you have uh, a number of other sports. Uh, Boxing is probably your, your most popular, but um, you've got darts, netball, gymnastics, snooker, ten pin, a, a bunch of others. Um, I, I'm wondering sort of where you've seen um, uh, you know spikes in fan interest around mm. those sort of more niche sports. When you talk about the you know, although boxing from a profile perspective is the biggest part of that business, darts from a revenue perspective is. I mean, it's just that. It's a phenomenon, you know, in terms of viewership, in terms of ticket sales. And now moving across so many markets, you know, Eastern Europe, we've had huge events, you know, historically in, in Holland and Germany now, but now Poland and going into all these new markets and selling, you know, nine, 10,000 tickets for a night of darts is quite incredible. And, you know, there has been movement into the United States with darts and it's something that we're looking at. We just sold out the Madison Square Garden Theatre for a two day event. For the US Open that did extremely well. And I think I think if we can get our foot in the door in the US market, I think the fans will really like it. I mean, through boxing, I've really un started to understand what you guys are like in terms of sport fans and what and what you like. And I think you'd really enjoy the experience of the darts. Other events, snooker obviously is huge in the UK and Asia, but you know, our formation of, of nine ball pool is really starting to grow now. You know, we have the Moscone Cup coming up later this year, which is Europe against America. That's at the Caribe Royale in Orlando. Already sold out, you know, 6,000 people per session. I think Nine Ball Pool has a huge future across America as well. You know, we know that it's a sport that has historically been played consistently. And now I think with bigger prize pools, with opportunities, as you said, to play leagues and tournaments and actually schedules during the year, I wouldn't be surprised if darts and, and nine ball pool started to make big waves in the United States as well. Just because you said you're starting to understand the American sports fan, you know, that's something I've been here all my life and I've, I've uh, <laughs> sometimes still don't know if, if I've got it entirely. I'm just wondering how you would describe the, the U.S. sports fan and, and what they take to. Yeah, I think, I mean, firstly, of course, hugely passionate as well. But, you know, I think the best way to describe it is when we were in Philadelphia the other week for Jerron Ennis, you know, we had 14,000 people in the Wells Fargo for that fight on the same day. You know, in, it's kind of like in a car parking lot there in Philly. You've got the three stadiums or the two stadiums in the arena. You know, you had 60,000 people coming out of a ball game an hour before our doors opened, 100 yards across the parking lot for the Wells Fargo. You know, so the, I think the best way to describe it is just the, the variety of demographics in, in key cities that we're in. So we're promoting big fights in Los Angeles, in Houston, in New York, in Philadelphia, in San Diego, in Chicago. And obviously every, every fan base within those states is very diff different. You know, when I'm promoting in the UK, what works in London works in Manchester. Well, what works in um, San Antonio doesn't work in Philadelphia, you know. So it's just about understanding your market and the different 
you know, the different states and cities that you go to. And we're finally starting to do that. And we're, we're recording some huge numbers now. Very interesting stuff. Eddie Hearn, thanks so much for joining us on the show. No problem. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Last week, AC Milan CEO Giorgio Ferlani stopped by the FOS studio. Dan Roberts, our editor-in-chief, got to sit down with the face of the esteemed Italian club to break down what it takes to be successful both on and off the field. That interview is up next. Okay, this is Front Office Sports. We've got Giorgio Ferlani, the CEO of AC Milan, in studio. Giorgio, thanks for being here. Thank you guys for having me. So it's AC Milan from Italy, but here we are in New York City. You are on a bit of a U.S. tour. What is AC Milan up to in the U.S.? Why are you here in America? Yeah, very good question. So first of all, uh, we are an American-owned company. So our main shareholder is uh, Redbird Capital. An investor uh, in FOS as well, we should say. Yeah, and uh, you know, one of the leading global investors in sports media and entertainment. And uh, we work very synergistically and uh, together with them to, uh, to create value and to grow uh, AC Milan. Um, the, we're here specifically to play friendlies. Uh, we're playing a friendly tomorrow uh, against Man City uh, in Yankee Stadium, and then we'll be playing uh, in Chicago against Real Madrid, and then in Baltimore uh, against Barcelona. Uh, but around that, uh, obviously the U.S. is a really important market for us. Um, I just talked about uh, Yankee Stadium. We have a partnership with the Yankees. Um, they are investors as well in AC Milan, um, and uh, we have various co collaborations with them. Uh, we, um, some of our content goes into the Yes Network. Um, we have two American players uh, in our squad. Um, you know, one is Christian Pulisic, arguably the best player the country has ever produced. Uh, and look, we have him because he's a really good player, not because he's American, but obviously um, you know, the two things work together. Uh, and broadly speaking, um, America is the biggest sports market in the world, and we want to be relevant in this market. Mm. We want to continue growing here. It has become our second biggest market uh, over the years. We sell just under 20% uh, of our jerseys globally uh, wow. in America. And How much of that is Pulisic, right? Uh, a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, we want to continue growing here and we want to give our existing partners from around the world the visibility through AC Milan uh, in America as well. So uh, very important for us to be here. We were in the States last year as well on the West Coast. Um, and it was five years we hadn't been in the States. So really important for us wow. uh, to be here Physically. Do you think this will now be an annual uh, pilgrimage? Uh, look, it, it, the summer is you know, kind of the off season, let's say, of, in the world of soccer. And it is uh, tradition to go on tours, let's say, to play friendlies against other top teams like us to kind of uh, get ready for the season. Uh, we've done it in America uh, the, the last two years. Um, I think we'll come here often. Mm. Uh, this is, as I said, an important market. And look, in terms of soccer in America, look, it's been growing uh, over the last couple decades. Uh, it's been, let's say, gaining market share. Uh, and, you know, this will continue going on. Um, you know, you have the World Cup here in 2026. So I think leading up to that and way beyond that, soccer will be uh, more and more important and more relevant in America, and we want to we want to play here. This is sort of a um, a recent-ish movement. The idea that you know European and and global soccer clubs really want to be in the states. You know, you said it's a really important market to you. What do you think happened in the last few years that that fueled that even more? I mean, at some point, you know, we could do the numbers, but there's also just anecdotally, we can all see it. We can all feel it. There is a soccer movement in the states. You know, maybe it's thanks to the World Cup and the, the international scale. Uh, the women's game has also been gaining a, a ton of popularity over the last few years. But what do you think are like the driving factors here? And, and what do you see happening in the near future uh, with that trend? Yeah, I think, I think a number of things. Uh, so number one, soccer was a bit of a, allow me to say, maybe distant fifth mm -hmm. sport in the U.S. And it's been 
grown it, growing uh, in, in popularity and it's gotten a bit to that critical scale to a certain extent. Um, uh, changes in demographics in the US, the fact that soccer uh, tailors to a more uh, diverse population, if you look at the stats compared to other sports, a younger crowd. Um, and you know the fact that European uh, clubs or teams or franchises that uh, effectively own the leading IP and the best content uh, in, in soccer in the same way that in other sports the leading content is, is in America, they've uh, really, uh, let's say, gone on a strategy to push the sport mm -hmm. in America. So it's, it's kind of both, let's say, demand-driven as well as supply-driven, and the two things have worked together over uh, the last few years. There's another element, uh, which is Americans, American families and investors it's just gonna go there. Right? have invested more and more in, in European soccer or football, as we call it. Uh, and, uh, and that has also created, I think, an interest in America uh, in, in the sport that pre previously wasn't there. Yeah, some of this does seem investment driven. I mean, you guys being owned by Redbird and as you mentioned, the, the Yankees and the relationship with Man City there. You know, I've gone to uh, NYC FC games and in the same family there in terms of the investment. Um, there's a little bit of a shift away in some cases from the one family owns a club for, for decades, right? I mean, originally it was the Berlusconis for, for AC Milan. How do you think that changes things either with the fan base? Maybe fans are largely unaware once you move from a family ownership model to private equity. But uh, you know, how does that affect kind of overall operations? Um, yeah, so I think I'll speak for European soccer. Uh, um, you know, it's an industry that hasn't really been professionalized over mm -hmm. the last many decades. And, um, you know, professional investors have seen this, they've done the benchmarking, and they've seen the enormous amounts of value that have been created in owning U.S. franchises. And then they look at what is the most followed sports in the world, and they look at sort of the, you know, where is the sport, really, where are the big brands or the big IP in, in soccer, and it's in sort of the top or European football clubs. And they see that you know, they're kind of undermanaged, underinvested, not professionalized. It's a very closed system. And so this means there's a gigantic opportunity um, to uh, professionalize the industry, professionalize leagues, professionalize teams, um, and, and really grow the value uh, in, a, in a similar way that has happened in American sports and that in Europe we're just at the beginning of all of that. Let's talk a little bit about your, your peers. In fact, at FOS, we wrote a story recently about how Real Madrid set a single-year revenue record for, for any you know, global soccer club. When you look at that, does that get your competitive juices flowing? I mean, there's performance on the field, and then obviously, especially for us and our interest in what we cover, there's uh, performance you know, in, the, in the books. So does that drive you to try new things, grow revenue in interesting ways? To what extent do you look at you know, your peers? 100%. We look at our peers and we, uh, we see what they're doing, uh, just like they look at us. Um, uh, I'll tell you a fun fact. Um, you know, when the current leadership of Real Madrid, so the chairman, Florentino Perez, took over Real Madrid about 20 years ago, AC Milan had higher revenues than Real Madrid. And he said, that's the model I want to I wanna reach and then beat. And he's managed, so congrats to him. Um, you know, in the same way, we look at you know, what they've been able to do, and, and we look th at that as a target. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's no sort of underlying uh, reason that we cannot get there. Uh, but, of course, we're, we're, we're very far from that. We're roughly uh, a little less than half of what they have in terms of revenue, which means there's a great upside uh, for us to be, to be able to achieve. So, look, we need to work as... AC Milan on our business. We need to work together with our league, so the Italian league, to grow the league and kind of the eyeballs and the attention on the league. Um, part of our business is driven by the league or leagues we're in. 
and so how they are being monetized because we have effectively a share of uh, the revenue created by the league and part of it is is generated by the work we do mm -hmm. with our sort of on our on the commercial side uh, look winning or being competitive is important uh, in in many ways a lot of the revenues we generate are in one way or another correlated to success on the field uh, and so the way media rights are split there's they're sort of success dependent in some ways or correlated to that and then a lot of other revenues we have are dependent on our success and you know how we can um, have other partners associate with us being successful on uh, on the field so that's an element uh, but uh, just going back to what you said about sophisticated investors investing in European football, that definitely m does not mean success at all costs. That's right. where a lot of people have been burned in soccer, where you chase the glory and you kind of spend senselessly and it doesn't really make financial sense. And ultimately that's a trying to chase glory in the short term, but in the long term, uh, you get in trouble and that, that, that then starts impairing your ability to be competitive on the field. So what we try to do is we set ourselves up at kind of in this period of the season, so at the beginning of the sporting season, to be successful to be able to win the league in Italy and to be in the Champions League and be competitive in the Champions League. But we do this while ra running a financially sustainable business mm -hmm. and so uh, another fun fact for you, um, two years ago we had the first profit in AC Milan's history uh, since uh, 17 years, so for 17 years AC Milan was operated as a loss. Um, last year we had a second consecutive year in which we're, we generated a profit and I don't think AC Milan has ever had in its history two consecutive years of, of making a profit. What does that mean then? Um, we don't put ourselves in a situation where, where we're cash constrained, we cannot invest, uh, and so on and so forth. So running a successful business together with a successful sporting side, the two things go together, and the two things are ultimately what create value in, in, in the club. We've been talking about looking at your peers, other clubs, both financially, on the field, you know, measuring yourself against them, Real Madrid, and others. What about in the U.S., especially because you're so focused right now on growing the fan base in the U.S. Do you look at the big U.S. sports league, either the team owners, what they've done, on the tech side, the commissioners? Do you take pages for, for management and performance from the U.S. leagues? So the U.S. leagues have a very different setup yes. than European uh, soccer. And sort of that model is hard slash impossible to really import or export into, uh, into Europe. Because we have, uh, you know, we have domestic leagues, so Italy or Germany or Spain, et cetera, et cetera. We have within that league what's called promotion relegation. Mm -hmm. And you have qualification for Europe-wide competitions. And, and so as opposed to being a closed system with a draft and a salary cap and all these setups of American leagues, it's, it's what I'll call like an open system in which you move up and down uh, into leagues in a given country and effectively into leagues in Europe. You move up and down if you qualify for Champions League or Europa League, which is the second to Champions League, et cetera. And you're on your own. You're very much... Yes, you know. correct. And so, so in terms of what can we learn from US leagues and how they're set up, I can say we can learn a lot, but can you really copy paste that in, into European soccer? No, no. Uh, really. Uh, and in, I also mean marketing, you know, to a fan base. Yeah. It's like the Yankees hat is a global symbol. Yes. Even to people who certainly don't follow baseball. Yes. So now, can you copy s certain things that individual franchises do uh, in, in America into the way we operate and run our business? Certainly 100% and we're doing it. Uh, so um, we do like to... Uh, see what others are doing successfully and try and imitate it. Um, and sometimes um, it, it's, it's on, what I'll say on-field stuff that goes from the medical to the use of analytics, mm. uh, analysis of opposition, et cetera, et cetera, to in the front office. And 
how do you kind of develop your business, develop your brand? And also another one is infrastructure. So stadiums, basically. Yep. So, you know, the, the, the best stadiums in the world, forget what sport it is, but are in America. Uh, just like the experience that you're able to offer to your fans in an, a new American stadium is very different uh, than the one we can offer our fans, for example, in our stadium, which is a 70-year-old stadium, which is a bit of a, a glorious stadium that kind of, if you ask soccer fans around the world and you say, look, give me the three stadiums you want to visit in your life, you know, most likely in those three is going to be San Siro, which is the stadium we play out at. But it's an old stadium. It was built a long time ago. Hard to without, that, yeah, that building. It, it, yeah. And so, look, we're working on a new stadium project uh, in a place called San Donato, which is a, a town just outside Milan. And uh, we do want to offer our fans the same type of experience that fans in America have, or also, look, in, in other places in Europe, there are new stadiums, like in England, they, they have been more successful at building stadiums. So that's, that's also one thing we copy, if you want, from, from America. We've been talking so much about like, the push and pull between the international game, coming into the US, growing the fan base here. Where do things stand in what used to be the age-old trend of international stars finish out their playing days in the US, often in the MLS, Lionel Messi mm -hmm. right now, versus here we are with AC Milan talking about Pulisic, an American player playing over in Italy. You know, is there a, what's, what's the balance now of either American players come abroad or it's international stars winding down their career in, in the US? Yeah, so that's really interesting. So, um, look, let me just say the US uh, soccer team and the players coming out of the U.S. have over the last decades really improved in quality. And Christensen is an example. As a, as a young teenager, he was a hot prospect and he, he first went to Germany and then England and then uh, came to us and, you know, uh, you know Yunus Musa is our other uh, U.S. players, kind of same story. He was, you know, since a very young age, he was, uh, you know, a, a hot prospect, if that's a word. And, uh, and he's, he's had a phenomenal career, and he will have a phenomenal career. He's a uh, 2002. As we, 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 we don't talk about the age of a player. We say the year he was born. That, that's kind of soccer spiel. Uh, and um, um, so you see a lot of young American players that come to Europe and kind of, if you want, complete their development mm. as young players and really play in the top leagues, no problem. Um, and that trend is, is going to keep continuing. Now, what I've seen in the MLS is an interesting, if you want, dual trend of the, the kind of superstars like Messi, you mentioned, uh, uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, mm -hmm. who's part of the leadership at, uh, leadership at AC Milan, is, is also did something similar, even though then he decided to come to AC Milan and finish out his career at AC Milan winning a title, which was kind of an amazing story. Uh, and you know, the guy who was our striker for the last three years, Olivier Giroud, he also just moved to, to the MLS uh, uh, in, in Los Angeles. So, so you definitely have the superstars want to finish their career in the US. But you also have another trend, which is uh, youngsters either American or Canadian or from Latin America go early into the MLS right. and really kind of develop there and then move when they're still young, but call it young to mid-career, uh, and then they move into, into Europe. So Big leagues. Into, <laughs> yeah, well, if you want. Uh, and so, <laughs> so there, is, there is also this, let's not just take the you know, end of career European stars or, or, or South Americans that were in Europe for most of their career. But let's also go early in mm. this, you know, this great pool of talent, which is South America. And let's s try and sign some, some young players over there. Something to watch for sure. Uh, let's end this way. So you got a game in Yankee Stadium this yeah. week. Next week, Soldier Field, home of the Chicago Bears. How will you measure whether this U.S. jaunt has been a success? 
so not on the field. And right. what I mean by that is, um, you know, these are games that you're, you're, you are putting your team to compete with other top teams uh, to prepare for the season that for us starts in, on the 17th of August. Uh, and it's not really about kind of winning the game, but sort of preparing for the season and how we're tactically set up. We have a new coach, so how is he, he going to field the team, et cetera. Um, we will consider it a success if there's something that we can take from this tour and bring it, if you want, into the medium and long term. So that means fans. We have an existing fan base. We come here also to engage with our fans. Uh, we want to build more fans. Uh, it means partnerships with companies that see the power of soccer and how it is growing uh, globally and specifically in America and want to work with us uh, and our existing partners and us uh, being able to uh, you know, give them visibility and bring them here with us. So it's a success if I wake up in six months or a year and there's something from this tour that you know, we've, we've created and we brought, brought with us and kept on growing with it. Got it. Well, good luck on the field. Thank you so much. Mille grazie. Thanks for joining us. Grazie a lei. Arrivederci. And I'm joined now by front office sports reporter Colin Salau. Colin, thanks so much for coming back on the pod. Nice to be here again, John. It's great to have you. So let's talk a little bit about this new piece that you released uh, yesterday, um, detailing some of the updates and the updated numbers on the WNBA's portion of the massive TV deal that was signed a couple of weeks ago, worth $77 billion total. We know $2.2 billion was supposed to be sliced, sliced off of that for the WNBA specifically. But talk to us about what are some of the new numbers that you're hearing and some of the latest updates about the growth of the WNBA and what they're really targeting in this new iteration of the deal. Yeah, so 2.2 billion is the number that it's getting from the three partners that it shares with the NBA, which are Amazon, ESPN, and NBC Universal. Um, I reported yesterday that there's a, a chance that that adds up in 2028 when they have a re-evaluation of that number. But the big the big news is that um, in um, is that the WNBA actually has the opportunity, opportunity to get new partners. Right now, the WNBA is already partnered with Scripps through their uh, channel ION and as well CBS, which is why they were able to raise their deal from 40 to 60 million in the current media rights deal. Now, they're get, the WNBA is getting 200 million from the three, new, from the three partners alongside ESPN, but they still could partner up with uh, CBS and Scripps again, and and potentially add another sixty odd or or more million to that contract, raising it to about in excess of two hundred sixty million a year, and ultimately getting that final deal to close to three billion dollars over eleven years. Now those things could definitely change, but the idea here is that more partners that the WNBA has that aren't necessarily in that deal with the NBA. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so from the perspective of, right, you obviously know that the WNBA wants to get this done and they're looking at these specific partners, as you mentioned, let's say that doesn't happen, right? Let's say the interest isn't necessarily mutual, you know, or if it, if it doesn't end up going through, as you said, things are subject to change. Are there other avenues that you get the sense that the league would be looking at, or are they only looking at these specific partners What's kind of the the contingency, if you have a good sense of that? I think there's going to be the WNBA. I, I think they're going to end up get, uh, partnering with with these two. But if they don't, they're definitely going to be looking around. They're adding games next season, most likely from 40 to 44. They're adding a new team next year and then another team the year after that. So they're going to have so much content. And I'm sure as you know, there's continuous and sustainable growth in the league, not just from Caitlin Clark, but when... Paige Beckers comes next year when Juju Watkins eventually comes. There's going to be interest from other places. You know, Scripps Ion might not be the biggest name, but they're here. They're they're trying to latch themselves on to the WNBA. So I'm sure there are going to be other partners down the line that are going to say, hey, you know, you have more content. We'll go ahead and take, you know, 
a few you know odd some games here and there um especially as the commissioner's cup continues to grow as new teams and we have a team in canada now so there's going to be a lot of that and i I wouldn't be shocked if they found another partner very very easily uh, assuming that cbs and or ion doesn't uh, stay on with them let's say this does end up going through in the full capacity and ends up reaching this three billion dollar number compared to the original 2.2 that was projected what does that do for the league? What is that extra cash infusion over, you know, this long-term period? Like, what does that do as the league is on this precipice of major growth and there's so much public interest right now? How can those things kind of intersect for the future of the WNBA? I think it's going to be massive. You know, the, the WNBA has struggled for a really long time. It's a lot of the reason why it's tied to the NBA. They've needed the NBA's support every step of the way and to even just not be dead at this point quite frankly was because they were tied up to the nba now if they're able to have these deals um they could slow maybe slowly distance themselves from the nba but even if not they're able to maybe pay their players better and if they pay their players better that could translate to you know better publicity better you know just a better product on the court and you'll never know how that will you know, continue down the line. And, and and one thing I will say is that there is a reevaluation time in 2028. Who knows how high that could go? Who knows also how that can change the distribution of the product? We don't know how technology is going to look like in 2030. We don't know what's next. So if the WNBA can also take advantage of that through its media rights deals, I think the sky's the limit at this point. You know, this is not an independently negotiated deal. As you mentioned before, it's using a lot of the same partners that the NBA is. Do you think in the future, is the WNBA looking to potentially break off and kind of negotiate some of this stuff on their own? Is the upside higher there in your assessment? Kind of talk talk us through like what this relationship between the two leagues look like and maybe if the WNBA, you know, is potentially headed in a different direction in the you know near future or long term. Yeah. So I don't think the WNBA will ever say that they want to split from the NBA. They owe the NBA a lot for them, you know, for their inception and then for their growth. But I do think that if they want to, you know, grow or to reach their ceiling, they're going to want to separate from the league. I mean, I, I wrote about the NWSL just yesterday and how the NWSL has the potential to to grow because it's independent of any other partners. It's not being weighed down. Now, that's not to say, again, I want to reiterate that the NBA has helped the WNBA get to this point. It's given them a lot of publicity, distribution. Uh, You know, Kathy Engelbert said in a press conference that the distribution that the NBA gives them is is, would not would not be something they could achieve potentially on their own. So I think they they still value the NBA. But if they are going to want to, you know, reach a higher ceiling, potentially pay their players better they're going to have to find a way to to separate themselves from the league. I still think it's going to be a long process. I think that the NBA if 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 they they're looking at the WNBA like, "Hey, we invested tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions on you guys and now you're growing. Why are we going to let you go now?" You know, they want to reap those rewards too. So, I I I see a world where, you know, potentially we, we see how this goes for the next maybe five to five to ten years, probably for the duration of this media rights deal. And then that's when the WNBA could probably, you know, kind of venture off on its own. Got it. Yeah, that that'll be a, a, an interesting kind of subplot with all of this as we watch over the next few years. We know the NBA has their own, you know, new products coming, but it's it's going to be interesting to see how the WNBA plays off that. So exactly. thanks for breaking it all down. Colin, thanks so much for joining the pod. Of course, John, anytime. The U.S. women's gymnastics team is no stranger to success. They won gold in three of the last four Olympics, including at this year's Paris Games. Each rendition of the team has had a nickname to go along with its success. In the 2012 games, they were known as the Fierce Five. At Rio in 2016, they were the Final Five. In Tokyo, the year that they won silver, they were known as the Fighting Four. And this year, the team has a new nickname. The 2024 games have widely been looked at as a redemption tour for the U.S. team. And after winning gold, Simone Biles christened the team as the quote, F around and find out five. She's since settled on a more safe for work name, the Golden Girls, paying homage to the 80s sitcom and the fact that this is the oldest U.S. gymnastics team in Olympic history. 
here's to more gold for U.S. gymnastics. The Kelsey brothers are continuing their tremendous run over the past year to the optimistic tune of $100 million. Earlier this year, Travis cemented himself as one of the NFL's best tight ends of all time with his third Super Bowl ring and a celebrity in all of our hearts since announcing his relationship with Taylor Swift. Brother Jason, who's perhaps the greatest center in NFL history, is enjoying his new NFL retirement and is launching a second career in broadcasting with ESPN later this year. All the while, the Kelsey Bros have been hard at work putting on one of the most listened to podcasts in the entire world right now, titled New Heights. Their hard work is about to pay off, literally. Tuesday, they announced that they've started speaking to new distributors, including Amazon, for their podcast Next Home, and are expecting a deal somewhere in the $100 million range. Not bad for a pair of brothers coming out of Westlake, Ohio. NBC has been crushing its coverage of the Olympics this year, putting 2021's Tokyo game numbers to shame. But what good are the eyes if you can't convert them into dollars? Luckily for them, NBC is doing both. In the Tokyo games, the company did 1.25 billion in sales, an impressive number in its own right. But this year, they're expecting to set a new record in substantial fashion. This is likely due to a combination of factors, time zone, the growth of Peacock, and the fact that the games are no longer limiting attendance, you know, due to that whole global pandemic. 70% of 2024 Olympic advertisers are brand new, and NBC also benefits from fresh deals with flagship brands like Coca-Cola. Gold medal results for the media giant. That's all for today. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And don't be afraid to send the pod to a friend or a colleague who might enjoy it. This has been Front Office Sports Today. We'll talk tomorrow.